All right, so we've been doing this food theme, and um, we've come to the conclusion that, that authorization really is the dessert of all of this. And so we have chicken. Chicken, that's what's for dessert. So I'm going to go through some list of uh, some ingredients for successful authorization. So ingredient number zero, we're going to start out here. This is our baseline. There will be no passwords. Ingredient number one, this is something that Pam touched on when she was talking about how you look at your identities. But for a successful authorization strategy, you want to start with your authorization requirements and your audit requirements and use those to drive the attributes that you propagate through your identity system. This is sort of classic data flow analysis. You start with where you want to end up and figure out where all that data comes from. And once you know what data you need to make proper authorization decisions, then you can figure out how, how do you trust that data, who owns that data, what's the process that they use to manage it. So if you're using, say, group memberships to control access to data in an application, well, you need to know who manages that group, who owns the group. Or if you're using user attributes like department or role or something like that, you need to know who owns those attributes in order to make um, trustable authorization decisions. So basically, start with where you want to end up at authorization and back your way through your identity system and figure out where those attributes come from. Ingredient number two is separate your authorization code from your application. And this is important from, for a lot of reasons, um, both from sort of a security and expediency point of view, but also from a, just a, a simple software engineering point of view. This is a classic separation of concerns. Authorization code is different from your application. Okay, line of business code has a particular characteristic. It, ha it evolves over time in a particular way driven by your organization's business requirements. Authorization evolves on a different cycle. It, it evolves as the company reorganizes or as people come in and go out or as governmental policies change. You really want to keep those things separate so that they can evolve separately. There's a third reason, which is that um, security code, security-related code, is usually harder than line of business code, or at least it requires a different kind of expertise. And you want to leave your security-related code to security experts. Okay, so then there's a fourth sort of expediency thing, or efficiency thing, I should say, which is you have the opportunity to reuse authorization code, because authorization mechanisms tend to be fairly common, even though the policies your authorization policies between applications are different, the mechanisms you use to evaluate those are often very similar, so you can share code between applications. And we've, talk, we've talked about externalizing identity from uh, applications, and if you look at how applications sort of have grown and evolved over time, almost all applications start out with identity and access management embedded in them. So uh, they, they started out with a database full of usernames and passwords and embedded in the code someplace was something that said, if your username is X, then you can do Y. Um, and over the years, we've successfully managed to extricate that stuff from the applications. So identity, we've pulled out using things like LDAP and, and cloud identity providers. Authentication, we've, externalizing, we've externalized using technologies like Kerberos, particularly in the Windows environment or SAML, or now OpenID Connect. Audit has been externalized using things like Syslog, or the Windows Event Log, and then tools like Splunk to aggregate all this stuff and produce audit reports that way. So the applications generally don't water, worry about how they do audit. And we're at the point now where we can start externalizing authorization from applications. And we've got several technologies to do that uh, with ExactMul, and OAuth, and UMA, which I'll touch on at the end of this. I'll cover all of these things. Ingredient number three for successful authorization is you should have your resource owners setting authorization policy. Not IT, and certainly not the developers. Now, this doesn't mean that your resource owners actually have to be typing policy into a computer but they have to be the ones that drive what the policy is. If you don't do that, 
then uh, you get what Pam calls the uh, chef surprise. Um, and this picture, interestingly enough, this is perhaps the worst thing I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> this is uh, an Icelandic dish called herkelk, which, believe it or not, is uh, seafood. And it basically comes from catching a shark, cutting off its head, taking all the guts out, and then burying the guts in the sand for about three months. Okay, until it gets really good and rotten and gelatinous and disgusting. And then you take that out and then you dry it. And then you cut it up in little cubes and eat it. It's fantastic. So, so definitely have your resource owners set your authorization policy, otherwise you're gonna end up eating this stuff, which is, is, is incredibly vile. Number four, um, authorization policy, not authorization code. And what's the difference here? Now, now, you know, code is really just an implementation of policy. The difference here is that when I talk about authorization policy, I mean something that's declarative. It's something that doesn't have flow of control and branching and, and that sort of thing in it. And why is that different? Why is that important? Why is that different from code? And the, the difference is, um, analyzability and verifiability. You can look at a policy that's declarative and determine essentially under what conditions will somebody get access to a resource. If you look at a chunk of code, you now have to sort of trace through the execution path and keep track of the states of variables and so forth. That becomes a lot more complicated and it, it really prohibits any kind of automated reasoning that you might do over your authorization policy. If you have a static declarative authorization policy, that's something that's easily analyzed. And if you get to the point of letting your resource owners actually set authorization policy for their applications, that has to be declarative. There's no way you can ask your resource owners to write some JavaScript that does authorization. Yeah, that's just not practical. Number five, authorization's got to be fast, scalable. It's got to be friendly to mobile and to APIs and, and to the web. And number six, you need to accommodate different authorization models. Now, how many people here use RBAC, role-based access control, in your organizations? So we've got a handful, like five or six. What about attribute-based access control? Again, another five or six. So these are all different authorization models. Okay, now it, these say nothing about mechanisms. This has nothing to do with how you do the authorization. It's the way you organize your, your authorization policies. And we've, over time, sort of graduated from enumerated access control, which is where you put people explicitly in a group, and, and that group means they can do something. And we've learned that that doesn't scale, right, in real organizations. We've gone through this, this uh, role-based access control where the access rights you get are determined by the role you have in an organization or on a team. And that works for maybe 20 to 50% of your access rights. The rest of the access rights that you actually need in an enterprise are typically uh, based on an, uh, on an ad hoc process where you just happen to be on a, on a project team or something like that and you need some special access rights for that or it's based on other identity information, so other attributes. That's where this notion of attribute-based access control comes from. And this last, uh, last model is context-based access control, where you incorporate not just information that you have about identities and resources in your environment, but you also incorporate contextual information, like how is the access being done, where is it being done from, or what has that user done recently? Um, is it consistent with its past access patterns? You know, that's another way of, of handling authorization policy. Um, so whatever it, mechanisms you use, you want to be sure that you can incorporate or accommodate these different, um, different models, these different authorization models. So any questions about that? Okay. So we're going to look at three different authorization technologies today. First one is, is OAuth 2, and it's designed and targeted to a very specific authorization problem. 
um, the, the, basically the password anti-pattern on the web. Now we'll also look at ExactMail, which is the extensible access control markup language, which has been around for a while. And that too is targeted to a specific problem, which is how do you take authorization policy out of programs and externalize it? And then we'll also talk a little bit about UMA, which can do all of these things. It can do what OAuth2 does, it can do what ExactMail does, and a whole lot more. It's, it's new, it's not really baked yet, and, um, but we'll touch on what, what, the, what the specs are doing now and, and sort of where it's headed. So OAuth2. As I said, the motivation for OAuth2 was really the password anti-pattern. So how do you get away from this problem that, that Dale uh, <laughs> demonstrated, which is you have a website that's prompting you for your username and password for some other website that it wants access to. And it's completely mindless that this still happens today. I, and I was, your bank account? Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> um, this is obviously a problem. We have to get away from it. So basically, OAuth2 answers the problem of how do I give access to this application or this service? How do I give access to that to my stuff on this other application or service? The important distinction here is I'm the owner of, of that. I control the authorization to it. The basic idea in OAuth2 is instead of giving you a username, you know, let's say I want Twitter to get access to my Facebook data, uh, instead of giving Twitter my Facebook username and password, I'm going to tell Facebook to give Twitter a token. And that token encodes authorization policy that says um, what is it allowed to do and how long is it allowed to do it for. So Twitter will then take that token, go back to Facebook and say, here, give me this information, and Facebook can, can restrict access to those resources based on that token. So um, Twitter never gets my Facebook username and password. In OAuth2, there are four roles. There's the resource owner, which is basically me. I'm, you know, I'm the guy who's making the authorization decisions because I own that resource. I own my Facebook pictures. Or actually, that's not true. Facebook owns my Facebook pictures now that I think about it. Um, there's the client. And this, this is a terminology. Uh, screw up, I think, in, in, the, in the way OAuth was described. The client here is not a client application as we normally think about clients. It's a apple, piece of software that is accessing my data. Uh, so Twitter, in this case, would be a client of Facebook. Uh, the authorization server, which is the thing that actually issues access tokens that provide access, and then the resource server is the server that implements the protected resource. So those are the four roles in OAuth2. And there are three kinds of tokens in, in the OAuth process. There's the authorization grant, which is basically, it's a string that describes what authorization I've, I've allowed. There's an access token, which um, the uh, client application gets and presents to the resource server. And then there's a ref an optional refresh token so that, that lasts a long time that the application can constantly refresh the access token. I'll go through the flows in a little bit so you can see how that all works. But those are the three tokens that we're going to talk about. And this is the, the sort of standard fully, um, uh, fully implemented OAuth protocol flow. And I'll, let me see, do I have a laser here? I do, okay. So basically the client, which is the client application, wants access to a resource that I control. So it goes and, and basically redirects me to an authorization. And there, it's not working anymore. OK, so redirects me to an authorization server so that I can authenticate myself and grant authorization to my resources. There is a grant code that goes back to the client application. And that's actually outside the scope of the browser. I'll explain how that works in a minute. And then the client application immediately turns around and takes that code and goes back to the authorization server and says, give me an access token. And that access token is the thing that it uses to get access with the resource server. So it provides that access token along with its resource request to the resource server and says, I, I need this information. And then the resource server will inspect that token and say, yeah, that looks right. 
here's the scope of information that I'm allowed to provide you, and then provide the results back to the client application. Okay, so at no point do my credentials or anything like that enter into this flow, or, or actually you know, end up getting passed between the authorization server and the resource server. Now, uh, Dale explained how you can control the lifetime of these tokens by using something called a refresh token. Now, the refresh token is an optional component in this, and it can have a potentially long lifetime. It might be days or weeks. And the application, uh, using an access token, um, will have that access token expire perhaps in a few minutes or a few hours, and then it can go back to the authorization server and say, get me a new access token. Now, the advantage to that is that you can have a long-lived session where the user doesn't have to be involved all the time, but if you want to essentially turn off authorization, you can by telling the authorization server that this, re this refresh token is no good anymore. So the next time that the application goes back to refresh its access token, it'll fail. Does that make sense so far? Nodding heads? Yeah, all right, thanks. So there are four grant types in OAuth 2, um, and each one has a different sort of protocol flow. Now what I just fully described, the full uh, protocol flow, is essentially described right here. So I access the client application through a browser. It needs access to the resource server. It redirects me to the authorization server. The authorization server pops up a form. I log in, and it says, what kind of access are you going to grant this application? And I say, um, it can access my photos. The authorization server then uh, redirects my browser back to the client application. And um, actually, I missed a step here. Part of the, the uh, authorization request includes a redirect URI that the client application provides. And even before all of this, there's, there's this step of registering the client application with the authorization server. I missed that earlier. There's, um, you actually introduce the client application to the, to the authorization server, and it registers a, a redirect URI. And it also provides that URI as part of the authorization request. The authorization server then redirects back to the client, and that has the authorization code, this short-lived authorization code. And the, uh, res the um, client application will then immediately redeem that authorization code for an access token. Okay, that's there in, in, uh, in 6 and 7. And then the client application will now go back to the resource server and say, uh, here's my access token, give me access to the resource. So that's how that flow works. And there's another flow called the implicit flow, which is a little bit simpler, but it's also um, insecure because the access tokens are exposed to the browser. So in this previous case, the access token never actually goes through the browser. The client application goes to the authorization server directly to get the access token. In this case, uh, and this is usually intended for situations where there's a JavaScript application running in the browser that needs to get access. Um, in this case, there's no... Um, client authentication at all. So there's no, no way that the client authenticates with the um, authorization server. And the, uh, the access token comes back to the client. It's actually visible in the browser, and that's where the risk is, is that its potential, the potential is that there is a way that some script or, or piece of code running in the browser can get access to that access token. And then everything else happens pretty much as before, the client application uses that access token to go to the resource server to get access to the resource. Yeah? Um, you mentioned the vulnerability in the browser. Uh, would well, the, the client application here is generally, so OAuth divides clients up into two classes, secured clients, secure clients and unsecured clients. In the full flow, um, the client is, is a piece of software that's capable of maintaining a secret. So when it registers initially with the authorization server, it gets an identifier and a credential. So it would be um, a service that's running on a server that's not generally exposed. Uh, 
Um, but in other situations where the client might be, say, a, a mobile app running on your phone or something like that, that would be you know, an insecure client that couldn't maintain the secret. Okay, this third flow is called the uh, client credentials flow. And, this, and basically, the resource owner is not involved in this, uh, not involved in this transaction at all. And you would use this when the client application um, stores its own resources, has its own resource server that it's responsible for. Or you might, um, there might be some prior agreement that you might say that Twitter always has access to Facebook photos or something like that. Um, so the resource owner isn't a separate party in this thing. The client has been um, registered with the authorization server and has some form of credentials with the authorization server. It just authenticates, gets an access token, and uses it. And the last flow here is the resource owner credentials flow. And this is essentially username and password again. So um, when the client application needs access to my resources, it will prompt me for my username and password, say, on Facebook. And instead of keeping that username and password information around, uh, it'll actually go to the authorization server and say, here are the credentials that I have. Give me an access token. And then throws away the username and password and just keeps the, the access token. Okay, so it's, it's riskier in the sense that I'm passing my username and password around again. On the other hand, the application's not gonna keep it, or it shouldn't keep it, certainly. This is like the middle of the road, password anti-pattern, yep. full-on code authorization flow, and this is in the middle? Yeah, basically, yeah, from a security standpoint, I would say so. So one of the things um, I just touched on briefly is this notion of scopes. And in the authorization grant and in the access token is a scope of authorization. And it basically says, um, what is it that the user is allowed to do? Now, the OAuth 2 protocol spec doesn't define scopes at all. Okay, well, it defines scopes as a space-delimited string of, of scope codes. Okay, but Beyond that, it's, it's up to you to decide what exactly your scopes are. So they could mean essentially anything. They might be an ACL or a permission. They could be user claims. They could be roles. Um, you get to define what scopes are. And, and there's, I think, quite a bit of discussion and, and sort of debate about what scopes really should be. This is one of the things that UMA is doing, is, is putting more structure and definition around the nature of, of resources and scopes. And this, in my mind, creates a, a problem from, from a software engineering and maintenance point of view, is that it creates a coupling between your resource server, the authorization server, and the client. So they all, ideally, would be able to evolve over time separately, but they're tied together with this definition of scope. So every time you change what scopes mean or you enhance the kinds of scopes that you provide, you actually have to make changes in the authorization server, the resource server, and potentially the client. Okay, so that's, that's something to be very aware of when you're implementing OAuth 2, is that you have this potential coupling between the three components. So, pros, OAuth 2, going back to our original ingredients here for successful authorization. It basically externalizes the authorization code from your application. That's, that's really, really good. Um, it integrates user authentication into the whole process, which is also cool. Um, Dale sort of touched on this, is the whole process of authentication and authorization are becoming a little bit more mingled together. Uh, we've traditionally thought of these, uh, of authentication and authorization as two totally separate processes that are independent of each other. And I think we're moving to a model now where authorization is driving, is going to drive authentication. So when you access a resource, an authorization policy will decide how much, what information do I need to authorize you and how much, value, how much uh, credibility do those, does that information have to have. Uh, and then if it needs more than it has, it'll ask you to re-authenticate or authenticate with a higher level of assurance. Okay, so we're moving, moving to this model now. 
Uh, obviously, it fits well with the web architecture. It's completely designed around web architecture and should perform really well because the interaction with the resource server is basically the normal request plus a little bit of added, added information in the header. So that's uh, pretty easy to deal with. On the downside, there's no notion of policies. There's no authorization policy in OAuth, okay? And there's not even a really great place to put it uh, in the model. You might, um, you might consider when the resource server validates the access token, there might be a way for you to insert some policy making, policy decision making there. Um, and as I said, scopes are totally undefined and left to the, re uh, left to the reader. And this wasn't really designed for your traditional enterprise authorization scenarios. It was really designed for this password anti-pattern on the web. Although I think you can apply this successfully to, to enterprise scenarios. It just requires a little work. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, is there kind of a base type of authorization policies that, or a base model maybe, that would help you understand things like OAuth and, and Exactl? And, and I'm not aware of anything like that. I mean, I'll talk some about Exactl coming up, and that might simplify um, the way you look at authorization policies. Um, but I'm not, I'm not really aware of a, a sort of a basic authorization model that would be suitable for both of those. Okay, so that's OAuth 2, and now let me talk about Exactl. Exactl is dead. This is according to Andrus Serre from a blog post about a year ago. And as you can imagine, that generated quite a bit of traffic on his blog, which I think ultimately was the whole point of that uh, statement. Um, one of the comments was, the rumors of Exactmal's death are greatly exaggerated, which I think is actually true. Um, Dave Wilson, who, pointed, uh, who posted that comment, uh, works for us. But if you go through the whole uh, series of comments, many of them from Exactmal vendors, on Andres' uh, blog post, you'll see that what he was really saying is that he doesn't get money questions from his clients about Exactl. I don't know if that says, what that says about how many clients he has or how interested they are in authorization. It's hard to, hard to make the correlation. I wouldn't leap from lack of questions to Exactl is dead. And my perspective is a little different. Um, Exactl isn't dead, but it kind of smells funny. <laughs> and uh, the reason I say that is Exactl was developed and architected using the last generation of technology, which was really SOAP and XML and, and designed for on-prem SOA kinds of architectures. It was never really designed with the web in mind. Okay, so not to say that it's dead, but it just kind of doesn't really fit with what we're doing today. Um, but I think it actually does work well in the environments that we're creating, and I'll say why that is um, as we go along. Um, so Exactmal stands for Extensible Access Control Markup Language. It's, a, it's an XML dialect. And I want to stress that it's a language. It's a markup language for access control. It's not a protocol. And in fact, if you look at the Exactmal spec, it says very explicitly, this spec does not define a protocol. Okay? It defines a policy language. It's very fine-grained. Uh, it's attribute-based, so the policy language lets you express authorization policies over the attributes of users and resources and operations and, and contextual attributes. And it's um, remarkably complete and flexible. In fact, it's a, ultimately, it's a Turing-complete programming language, except it has no flow of control. And it has interfaces that are standardized um, that are both sort of soapy and restful. So there's a, a REST JSON profile for doing exact authorization decisions. So that aspect of it, I think, fits very well with, what we're, with modern applications. 
There are also some standard, well, I shouldn't say standardized, they're not standardized, but there are some common programming APIs that are available um, that you can use with multiple ExactMOL implementations. And they, they basically are available in any, any programming language you might want. So when I first was exposed to ExactMOL, and this is probably about five, six years ago, six, no, more than that, six, almost seven years ago, um, I saw this architecture diagram. And this is a notional architecture. This is not how ExactMOL servers are necessarily put together. But when I looked through this architecture, I said, that's the way to think about authorization. I mean, it just really grabbed me from, from a software engineering point of view that this was a righteous architecture for authorization. The idea is that you have an access requester, so that's a, a user making an access to an application. And in that application is something called the policy enforcement point. And that's the piece of code that's responsible for either executing the operation or not, okay? The policy enforcement point works with a context handler um, to make an authorization decision. So if I have an application and I have a request coming in from a client that says, I want to access this bank account, the application says, well, here's the attribute information I have about this user. Here's his user ID, here's the bank account, and here's the operation that he's trying to perform. He's trying to access the current balance. You just take those attributes, pass them to the context handler and say, give me a decision. Okay, I don't know what the policy is, I don't care about the policy, just tell me whether I should do this or not. Okay, context handler passes that to the PDP, which is the um, policy decision point. And the policy decision point has access to all of, the policy, all of the authorization policies that might apply, and based on those attributes, we'll decide which one is the, is the effective policy. And then we'll look at that policy and say, well, I need some more attributes to make this decision. Or it may have enough and just say, here's the decision, yes or no. But it also can say, in order to make this, this um, decision properly, I need to find out when, when I last accessed my bank account. So it can then go to an external data store um, and get that attribute information and inject that into the policy decision making process as well. At the end of the day, the policy decision point comes back with a yes or no, passes that back to the policy enforcement point, which is the application, and the application either performs the operation or doesn't. So when I saw that architecture, that made lots of sense. And the, the great thing about it is it's a complete decoupling of authorization from the application. And it's very arm's length. So the application can evolve on its own terms completely independently of authorization policy, okay? All of the, the only agreement between the two components here is that the application provides some attributes. Whatever attributes it has, it gives that to the PDP, and the PDP, the agreement with the PDP is that the PDP will render a decision and the application will observe it, okay? So I can completely rewrite my authorization policies and not change anything in my application. Okay, and that, that just struck me as a remarkable approach to, to authorization. So ExactMOL has this, this sense of it as being really big and really complicated and, and sort of old school and heavy and all of this. And yeah, there, there is that aspect of it, but I'll explain why I think that's a misperception. I mean, really when you get down to it, ExactMOL is a policy engine, okay? And it's a language for expressing policy and it's a way for evaluating that policy. So you say, here's a policy, and here's a bunch of attributes, grind it up and give me a decision. That's ExactMOL right there, okay? That's really all it does. So the, the protocol flow in ExactMOL is the application makes a request to the authorization server, the authorization server provides a response. And that's really the extent of the protocol flow. And there are two standardized protocols. There's, there's the SAML XML request response uh, protocol, which is your typical sort of SOAP kind of thing. And then there's also a REST JSON request response protocol, which is quite a bit lighter weight. Optionally, the authorization server can get more attributes if it needs it. Um, 
uh, it could be LDAP, it can be SQL calls, it can be magic, it really doesn't matter. Or it could be that the authorization server has all the attributes locally and it just fetches that information locally. Um, that's not really part of, that's actually not part of the standard, but it can be part of the implementation. So this is um, an example of a, an XACML request. And the request here basically says, the user identity is gil at gilkirkpatrick.com. The resource he's uh, looking to access is this URL here, the price list, the 2014 price list. And the operation that he's trying to do is a read. Okay, now that's, that's not that hard to understand. That's pretty straightforward. And that's the same thing in JSON. So same information, um, quite a bit fewer bytes. And that's all the application has to do, right? The application just formats up that bit of JSON, sends it over to the PDP and gets a response back. So it's pretty simple. Now the policy model in Exactmal. Well, oh, let me stop a second. So any questions about that? Yeah. Right. So, so well, let, right. Now, what I what I showed here actually aren't policies. This is just the request. Okay. So, this is the the uh, application requesting a decision. Um, you're right. Policies can be quite a bit more involved, and that's actually what I'm going to talk about here. Is there another question back here? I thought I saw a hand. Okay. The, um, the policy model, and this is, I think is a problem in exactly. Well, the policy model is really, in my mind, um, overblown. And this is where the 80-20 rule wasn't, wasn't well applied, I think. Um, let's start out with the notion of a policy set. A policy set is a group of policies. And along with that group of policies is something called a combining algorithm. And that's basically the rule that says, if I evaluate these policies and they come up with different decisions, which one do I pick? Okay, but those policies are potentially created by different people uh, at different times. They're all aggregated together and they can be evaluated together. And if there's a conflict, I can resolve them using the combining algorithm. Combining algorithm might be something like um, deny overrides, which means if any of the policies that I evaluate comes up with a deny, then I'll just deny it. Uh, or it might be the first one that's applicable. I go through the list of policies and the first one that matches the request, I'll use that one. That, that's an example of a combining algorithm. Now, an individual policy has a target, which is some combination of resource subject and operation attributes. So this is what information the application passes into the PDP. And that's how the PDP decides which policy to use. There's a collection of rules and a rule combining algorithm. So we have the same kind of thing going on here that we had with the policy combining. Um, and then obligations and advice. I'll just touch on obligations and advice because they're not critical to the way Xactimal works, but they're interesting. Um, in addition to re rendering a decision, yes or no, uh, the PDP can provide an obligation to the application as well. And what that says is, um, you can perform the operation, you are allowed to perform that operation, but in addition, you have to do something else. And the, um, the obligation is really just, it's a, it's a URN with some additional attributes tagged onto it, and it's up to the application uh, to perform that obligation. And, and the understanding is that if the application can't perform that obligation, then it shouldn't allow the operation. So an example would be, um, you can make this high value transaction but you have to create an audit log entry for it. Okay, the obligation is to write an audit log entry. That's an example. Advice is sort of the same thing as an obligation, except there's no requirement that the application actually perform it. Okay, it's just additional information that might be useful to the application. So, uh, and then finally, within a policy are rules, and rules are essentially just an expression. So it might be, is member of the accounting department and is a full-time employee and um, 
is uh, working, has been assigned to the Foo project. That would be an example of, uh, of a condition. And if that condition is true, then you allow them access. The wonderful thing about Xaml is that the policy language is completely flexible and complete. You can, I'm pretty certain you can express any kind of policy that you want using Xaml. The problem with all of this is that if you look at an, at an Xaml policy in the XML, the raw XML form, which I don't advise that you do, but if you do, um, this thing is, is wildly complicated. And, and it's like an entire, I tried to put a policy up here on a slide and I couldn't do it. Okay, even a simple policy, it wouldn't fit. So I, I think this is, this is a failing in Xaml because 80% of the time, your authorization policy is fairly simple. <laughs> That's a good, I'll remember that. that. That would be about a three-point font, I think, on, on this thing. Um, and this is something that I think is, is important for um, Xaml to do, is to provide a simplified policy model for the 80% of the applications that could really use that. So on the pro side, Xaml externalizes authorization completely from your application. It's brilliant that way. Um, it's well standardized, it's well thought out, it's, it's very complete, it's expressive. I mean, as a policy language, it's really, really good. You get instantaneous provisioning, the, the deprovisioning. The model is that whenever the application is going to perform an operation, it makes an authorization request, okay? So if I change an attribute for a user, the next time he tries to perform an operation, it can, the, the behavior will change, right? So it's instantaneous. There's this no notion of token lifetimes that you have to wait to expire. Um, there are plenty of Xaml vendors. There's plenty of open source Xaml implementations. There's lots of, lots of Xaml around. There are, um, all of the vendors have SDKs that make it very easy to integrate. There are standard SDKs that you can use. So from a programming standpoint, using Xaml is, is really simple. On the downside, as I said before, it's, it's over-elaborated. The, the policy language in particular, I think, is over-elaborated. And it's not just the language itself, it's the, the policy model, I think, is over-elaborated for a vast majority of cases. It doesn't address the password anti-pattern, has nothing to do with the client. Um, authorization is just not in scope, for example. So it has nothing to do with those things. Excuse me, authentication is not in scope, for example. And there's an implication that because the application, every time it performs an operation, it's gonna go somewhere and ask for an authorization decision, that that's a performance issue. Um, and I would say in practice, that's not really true um, compared to the actual request response from the client. The cost of the authorization decision is, is usually pretty small. Um, but there's plenty of ways to mitigate that performance issue as well. I mean, one is you can put the PDP on the same box with the application, so it's just an IPC. Or there are also PDP library implementations. You can put it right in process with your application and, and make that overhead go away completely. There are things like decision caching and all of that that you can also do to make that go faster. But in truth, I think you'll find that that's not really a performance issue. And in fact, um, I, I said earlier on that that example kind of smells funny because it's not really web oriented and it's kind of not the modern way of architecting things. But in fact, some really large web properties like, uh, like eBay and PayPal all use Xaml. Okay, so it scales, there's no question. I mean, you have to go through some effort to scale it, um, but it does scale, there's no question. Okay, any questions about Xaml? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I I would say it's my observation is it's on a on a pretty linear growth curve right now. It's not skyrocketing, but it's steady uh, incremental not incremental additional implementations over time. So I, I couldn't give you an idea of penetration. I have I don't have any sense of of that. Um, but basically, anybody who is looking at attribute-based access control as a model for authorizing applications and resources um, are looking really hard at Xaml. Uh, yeah, one, one comment there is yeah. um, 
I think I covered this a little bit, and you had almost identical in your presentation that I think part of the adoption for ExactML is waiting for the adoption of uh, federated authentication. Uh, you know, we, we both had a, a similar slide that it's the next step in the, in the externalized chain. We started with externalizing user accounts and then externalized authentication, and then we'll externalize authorization. So I think the slow adoption for ExactML has somewhat been waiting for uh, federated authentication to take off, and yeah. then, we'll, then we'll be on to externalized authorization. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. It, it's, as I showed earlier, as Dale mentioned as well, we've succer successfully externalized identity, we've externalized authentication, we've externalized audit. The next step is to externalize authorization. I think there's another, another thing that's been an inhibitor uh, is that you, if you have an existing application and you want to retrofit ExactMall to it, well, you basically have to dig out the source code, figure out where the authorization code is in there, um, which is usually not in one place. It's scattered all over the source files. Um, and rework the source code to incorporate uh, externalized authorization. And truthfully, I think a lot of companies will look at that and say, you know what, it's just not worth it. I've got more important things to do right now. But we're now in this mode where lots of companies are taking their existing applications and they're re-architecting them for the cloud. And this is the time to um, implement externalized authorization for those applications. And that's where we're seeing pickup, is people who are moving to the cloud or, or taking, they're, they're realizing that their old creaky line of business applications need to be redone and they're rewriting them anyway that's when they're externalizing the authorization policy. Yeah, well, I've got one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Pat was talking about um, the issues related to provisioning of deep mm -hmm. And obviously, there's some developments um, you guys are doing and others about the combination of exactable and provisioning. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So, so you know, we think about exactable in terms of authorization. Um, but as I said earlier, it's really just a policy language. And you can use it to implement any sort of policy. Anytime you, you have a rule that you want to evaluate, that's something that you could express in ExactML. Um, so we use it for other stuff as well. So like policy based around provisioning or policy around um, how you do publish subscribe or something like that. Um, it's not just about authorization, although that's what it's for. Um, it's a very general purpose policy language and you can use it for lots of other interesting stuff. Okay, so on to Uma. Uh, actually, before I go on, any other questions about ExactML before I do that? Okay, so user managed access. Um, user managed access is sort of new and old. It's been, I know Eve, Eve is, are you here? Yeah, you are. How long have you been working on this? Yeah, so Eve, Eve has been, um, been driving this, uh, this train forward for five years, and I would say it's just in the last year and a half or two years or so that it's really picking up traction. So it's, it's not done yet. The specs are still being worked on. Um, and if you go through the UMA specs, it's described as an OAuth 2 profile. And I, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say it is a another approach to authorization that leverages all of the work that OAuth 2 does. It uses the OAuth 2 mechanics. I think it's, it starts with fundamentally different assumptions from OAuth 2. Um, so I wouldn't actually call it a profile of OAuth 2, but it uses a lot of OAuth 2. So first off, the big, big difference is that it is much more in the ExactMill model in that it controls access to resources by anybody, not just the resource owner. So if you remember in OAuth 2, that was all about the resource owner controlling access to his own resources by an application, okay? In UMA, this is about the resource owner controlling access to their resources being accessed by anybody using any application, okay? So there's much more in the ExactMill model that way. Okay, the, another thing that it does differently is it formalizes the, um, the relationship, there's actually a protocol flow when you uh, register a resource server with an authorization server. There's an actual API that you use to formalize the agreement between your application, your resource server, 
and the authorization server. And that's something that's, that's left um, completely out of the definition of OAuth 2. Um, the normal model is that you write the resource server and the authorization server together, and it's the same team or two closely coupled teams that are writing them. Um, in UMA, UMA actually allows for the idea that I have my resource server over here written, by, written and operated by somebody else, and I can delegate the authorization work to another server being run by somebody, some other organization written by an entirely different group of people. And it provides the, the, uh, the ritual for registering my resource server with that authorization server to make that happen. And another thing, and this is, this is an aspect of UMA I'm not really up on, but I, I think is really interesting, is it explicitly recognizes the fact that people are part of this um, whole discussion as well, and that people and organizations have obligations to do things in certain ways. So it's not just about how uh, programs interact. There's actually recognition that people have obligations as well. So the roles in UMA are largely the same as in OAuth 2 with a couple of differences. One is the client application um, is not just accessing a resource on the resource owner's behalf. The client application is accessing a resource on anyone's behalf. Okay, it could be a totally different person who's accessing a resource uh, using some other random client application. And the uh, additional role here is the requesting party. So whereas before the resource owner was the requesting party in OAuth 2, in UMA, the requesting party is somebody else. It's a totally separate entity. In UMA, there's a bunch of different tokens. In fact, there's actually more than this, but they're really OAuth tokens that are used for particular um, authentication steps or uh, authentication authorization steps. Um, there's a protection API token. So the, the, the authorization server has a well-defined API um, for protecting a resource. So when you introduce your resource server to uh, the uh, UMA, authorization server, there's a well-defined API for that, and you use this protection API token to control access to that. There's the authorization API token. That's the API that a client application and the user access to get a token to actually access the resource, which is the RPT. That's the requesting party token. Now here's the, here's the protocol, the canonical UMA protocol flow, and I've actually missed a couple of steps in here. And one of the things you'll notice is this is quite a bit more involved um, than what we have in, say, OAuth 2. And this is actually one of the things that, that concerns me a little bit about UMA. I'm being a little unfair here because there's actually sort of three separate steps to this. And so they happen on different, on different time scales. But I'll just describe it briefly. Um, before anything really happens, the resource owner uh, basically introduces the resource server to the authorization server. This is sort of a registration process where you say, I want that authorization server uh, to control access to my, to my application. And there's a well-defined API for that. And the resource, uh, the resource server, my application server, will then register the APIs that it wants protected. Okay, so that sort of happens on one time scale. And then when, the, uh, when a requesting party using a client wants to access my resource server, the resource server will say, um, you know, you don't have a uh, requesting party ticket. Go talk to my authorization server if you want to get access. And that uses the usual redirect scheme. The client will then go talk to the authorization server. And the user and the, the, the requesting party, the user here and the client, may actually have or will have to authenticate to the authorization server at that point, which means that they have to go through some form of gathering claims uh, about the user and the, um, about the application. And the authorization server will then pass an RPT back to the client. The client will go back to the resource server and say, here's my requesting party token give me access to this resource. Now there's a, yet another step in here, which is that that RPT may not have sufficient permissions for that application to access the resources. Uh, 
This is a part of the flow I don't quite have my head around about why this is the case. But um, it will have, there's the situation where the uh, client application will go back with the RPT, say, give me access, and the authorization server says, well, you've got an RPT, but it doesn't have enough permissions to access the thing you're trying to access. So what it does, or I'm sorry, the resource server, the resource server will then register a permission set with the authorization server and say, this guy was trying to access this resource, here's the permissions that he actually needs, and it'll deny the client again. Okay, and then the client will go back to the authorization server with that ticket, that permissions ticket, and say, give me a fully featured RPT that gives me access to this resource, and I'll go back to the resource server. Um, and then finally get access to the resource. Okay, so you can see that the protocol is, is, is got a lot more pieces to it. The registration piece kind of stands on its own where you register the, the resource server with the authorization server. So that's not, that's not really a complicating factor, I don't think. But this idea of where the client can get redirected twice back to the authorization server is, seems like a unnecessary complexity. Eve, I know you wanted to say something about this. Yeah. Oh, cool. me just insert myself into this. Um, so I, I'm the chair of the UMA group and I just want to um, let folks know that in fact the, the specs uh, are stable at what we call a VO.9. Think of it as a last call. And that's going to go for public review shortly as soon as people get back from their weekends, I think. And um, we, we have a sort of principle of not prematurely optimizing flows. You know how sometimes you have to now unoptimize them again. So we're right at the juncture where it's a little bit of a chatty protocol, but it's um, it was designed to take care of really web-oriented, API-oriented, mobile, even IoT-oriented use cases. And so um, uh, some of those things are designed to wait and see how the use cases come out and we can maybe optimize. Sure. And the, we, I think the time is right for optimizing, so I hope that you'll bring those use cases to the table. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for the chance to do this. <laughs> Sixty seconds. Okay, so one of the, one of the interesting aspects of of UMA in the UMA architecture is, you know, in Exactmal we delegate the authorization decision completely to the uh, authorization server, the, the Exactmal PDP. In UMA, you can actually um, put more or less of that decision making capability on the authorization server. So you can have the authorization server make part of the authorization to server uh, make part of the authorization server decision. And you can have the application, the, the resource server, make the rest of it. Um, and I haven't really explored this in detail, but the idea that you can kind of adjust where the decision gets made, I think, is pretty interesting. So on the pro side, UMA externalizes authorization from the application, and it does it in a way that is much more complete, I think, and takes care of many more scenarios than OAuth 2 does. And it explicitly recognizes the need for uh, policy in the authorization process. Um, it supports user and application authentication and authorization, incorporates all of that activity into the flow, which is really good. As I said before, you know, we're sort of in this mode of, of merge, I don't want to say merging because they're two separate activities, but sort of inter, interweaving authentication and authorization. And UMA supports that kind of thing. And most importantly is it puts the resource owner in complete control of uh, authorization for, for his resources. Now on the downside, it's not fully baked, it's completely new. Um, there aren't any real, as far as I, Eve, what, what's, where are we at with like real, real live implementations? Sure. 
So it's, it's early days yet. You know, there's, no, there's no sort of flagship implementation at this point. Um, but I think the model is really interesting and it solves the problems. I, I think it's, it fills the holes of OAuth while using OAuth and it also fills the holes of XACL. Um, and even though it doesn't explicitly have a policy mechanism, it's really clear where you put that into the flow, uh, which is in the authorization server. So the idea when the authorization server is making the authorization de decision, it can go export that to a, a, an exactal policy engine. I think it makes total sense. So my Zagat survey here on our, uh, on our meals. Um, I'm just gonna leave this here and let you, I'm not gonna read through it. Um, but one thing, uh, if you note, I, I took a look at all of our green eats at the top here and relatively how the different technologies support those. Um, if I put two stars there, it means it doesn't really help or hinder. You know, it doesn't get in the way, but it doesn't necessarily support it. Um, and you'll notice that if you sort of add these all up and come up with a bunch of stars at the bottom, the combination of these um, is pretty compelling. And in particular, I think the injection of Xacmal into things like OAuth and UMA makes total sense because it gets you externalized authorization from your application and it gets you policy um, that you can reason over outside of the scope of the application. All right, so take a look at UMA. I think that's, that's really important. If you've got sort of resource owner authorization requirements, OAuth 2 is totally the way to go. And look really hard at Xacmal as a way of externalizing authorization policy because that language, you know, I want to get, you, get your head around the idea that really what it is is a policy language for making decisions. Um, the, the idea that it's somehow protocol heavy and all of that I think is, is really kind of missing the point. All right, so I, we don't have much time for Q&A, but I'll take a couple questions if there are any. And there aren't, so thank you very much. I appreciate it.